Uh, our first presentation um, this afternoon is by uh, Dr. Kelvin Berryman, who's come all the way from uh, New Zealand to be with us. Um, if you've watched any of the, the world events, the uh, earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand was a very uh, damaging event um, and had a lot of similarities to what we would expect to see here, both with respect to the infrastructure and the type of earthquake that occurred. So uh, he has come all this way to share with us some lessons learned and highlight some of the things that, uh, that occurred there that we might expect here. So, Dr. Behrman. And today, with acknowledgments uh, to many New Zealand colleagues who have done much of the science, and to, uh, with the assistance from some US colleagues who have helped uh, with some introduction to the uh, Memphis or the, the, uh, the region, I thought it, well, one would like to talk a little bit about the characteristics or comparisons, and I see from the handout that I'm just going to reinforce some of those things that are in the handout about the comparisons between um, Christchurch and the New Madrid uh, seismic zone. Uh, we've had air earthquakes, uh, New Madrid, of course, uh, 1811, 1812, uh, but that's now 200 years ago, so we're looking forward and I would like to perhaps introduce to you some of the things that we're still challenged with in New Zealand in the recovery phase and looking forward in terms of uh, these questions of resilience and um, acceptable risk and etc. Oh, sorry, I'm looking <laughs> confusing myself here. So just those two topics there. Uh, to speak to. Uh, really, I'd rather spend time here in a conversation rather than in a presentation, so I really would like just to set the scene and so that we could uh, discuss some of the uh, points or questions that we're st still struggling with in New Zealand as well. In the handout, you'll see that actually I was really struck by the fact that we've got, um, we've got Regions, the scale is a little bit different, but there are many similarities between Memphis and, um, and Christchurch. Both born in the 1800s, both near rivers for transport and what that brings with it as well, a similar building style, but also this low-lying area, high water table and soft sediments are, are going to be key um, issues for the future earthquakes in Memphis and what we've seen here in, um, in Christchurch. Uh, just briefly there about the scale, uh, the one thing I'd like to um, emphasise there is uh, things are bigger in the USA. Uh, the scale on the left, we've got the, you know, that's roughly 400 kilometres across there. Across the Canterbury Plains there on the, on the right, that's around about 100 kilometres from Banks Peninsula, the old extinct volcano to the right, and the foothills of the Southern Alps. So the scale is rather different, and, but to some extent the earthquakes of 1811-12, the uh, uh, larger than magnitude 7, uh, at least, and maybe significantly larger, and in Christchurch really the damaging earthquakes were in the magnitude 6 range. Um, so it is in some way scaled in that sense. Um, you will know better than I the sequence of earthquakes in the New Madrid uh, zone, 1811-12, but three major earthquakes. Um, and in Christchurch, really the, the big event, starting there with the, uh, with the star, was the 4th of September event. Complicated earthquake in its own right, in that it ruptured a little uh, blind thrust here. And then there was surface rupture on the Greendale Fault. That's about uh, 40 kilometres long, 30 kilometres long on the surface. But there was also secondary or, or, or uh, complicated secondary faulting with a reverse fault at depth out here near the end of the sequence and towards the eastern end. It was followed, as you know, September, then in February 22nd, the devastating uh, earthquake. It was smaller, magnitude 6.3, um, but it was directly under the city with some um, high stress drop and directivity into the city. So the, really that was the event that caused all of the damage or much of the damage, followed then with the 
And those, uh, the aftershocks associated with those, with that event, are the red dots, followed on June the 13th, so about six months later, by another magnitude six earthquake with orthogonal. The fault direction was primarily this way, north south or northwest, whereas this uh, February event was in this direction. And the aftershocks following that are all in blue. And then at the very end of 2011, magnitude doublet of earthquakes, magnitude 5.8 and 5.9 just offshore. And the events since then, and this is up until the end of, this, yes, end of 2012, are the pink um, aftershocks. So definitely a tendency here of uh, starting in the west and very unfortunately progressing towards the city. Um, we don't know why it progressed towards the city. This was a bilateral rupture. It ruptured in both directions. So we could have been more lucky and it triggered further, if it was going to trigger further events, they could have been away from the city. Thank you very much. But, but no, Wellington, um, Christchurch was exactly in the wrong in the wrong place. So very unlucky. Um, I think that you know the 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 events here in 1811, 1812, a long time ago. So rather harder to um, relate. You know the timing of the various events. Um, I think questions here also about uh, the migration or progression or the stress um, changes that went on, um, but here in Memphis, down here at the south end of the zone. Um, certainly I think there's considerable concern and knowing Tish Tuttle's work just a little bit and in other work, the estimate of sort of 500 year recurrence intervals of, or of that uh, like for, the, for these sorts of events means that there's a reasonable probability here in Memphis already. Somewhat differently in Christchurch because these would appear to be have returned periods of many, many thousands of years. In fact, post-earthquake, we've done some high-resolution seismic work on this fault, knowing that it must exist from the inversion of the geodesy and the seismology. There is a very good marker horizon from the volcanic uh, materials here that go down underneath the plains. This is about six million years old at the youngest. This fault has at most about 10 metres of displacement in six million years. So it really doesn't figure in the seismic hazard even going forward. So we've got, that's one of the differences I think in terms of the scenario between um, Christchurch and Memphis. However, the earthquakes, um, the cause of the consequences of the earthquakes have many, many um, similarities. Complicated. Is certainly is the name of the game, very different from the San Andreas or the Alpine Fault in New Zealand where you have very long faults that are reactivated very frequently. Here we're in regions where the fault orientations can be very complicated. This is the complex faulting that occurred during the 4th of September earthquake. As I said, the February earthquake with an orientation roughly a long strike of that, but the June earthquake in a, just the orthogonal direction and then the uh, February, then the December earthquakes, again with a slightly different change of orientation. Uh, this is showing February and June. In fact, the fault planes may be overlap with one another at depth in a way that is really quite difficult to understand. Similarly here, that with the orthogonal faulting um, that occurred in the 1811, 1812, probably as reactivations of very old structures. So understanding the old geological structure is in some ways the key to understanding what is possible in terms of scenarios going forward. Um, yes, somewhat of a surprise, I suppose, in some senses, although um, with hindsight, particularly with the repeated liquefaction work, we've seen really strong evidence of the repeated earthquakes um, here in the uh, New Madrid zone. Um, this fault rupture in New Zealand was certainly a surprise. There is a vague possibility that it was a previous event on this fault in the age of this topography, which is about 16 to 18,000 years old. 
but no, not very clear. So it's very possible that there was either only one other event or there was no prior event in the last 18,000 years uh, in terms of surface rupture on this fault. So very rare. Um, when we were first alerted and we were told the epicentre of the earthquake, we said uh, the seismologists have got it wrong because there's no faults there. Well, <laughs> indeed the seismologists did have it right and there was this very spectacular here at this point around about um, five metres of stroke slip uh, displacement with just a little bit of reverse, a uh, little bit of vertical. In the city of course there was this very widespread liquefaction um, um, in, both, in both the um, earlier September event even though it was um, 30 kilometres away uh, but particularly in February and in June and of course here in, in the Mississippi embayment there was very extensive liquefaction which can be seen today and there's some nice photographs in the, uh, in the handout. Just to set the scene slightly in terms of the South Island, again a rather different picture in terms of why the earthquakes were occurring where they do. In the South Island here in New Zealand looking north along the Alpine Fault, so there's the plate boundary, there's the San Andreas equivalent in New Zealand, 25 to 28 millimetres per year over here. Um, you can see that it breaks up into a series of faults here and further south of course we've got different, a, a setting that looks a lot more like California than it would of the central US. Um, the, the important thing though is that out here in this part we're seeing the old fault structure is in the east-west direction, whereas the new fault directions are all in the northeast direction. So what's happening here at the sort of the margin or the edge of the plate boundary zone, there's reactivation of these older faults. These are Cretaceous normal faults, uh, so they're 100 million years old, and they're being reactivated with quite slow strain rates, but they're reactivating a very complicated fault structure, and it's reactivating in a very strange way in the sense where, that we're getting not very, um, we're getting um, old normal faults trying to reactivate under a different stress field. So that brings about some complications in terms of the earthquake source uh, and plays into the fact that these, are, these have high energy for magnitude as you see here in the eastern US um, so although we're only 100 or 150 kilometres away from the plate boundary, this is acting quite similarly to some areas quite far from plate boundaries. Um, in the, the US, this is the, um, the situation of the old failed rift perhaps, perhaps um, and a concentration of strain that's occurring in the Mississippi embayment. Uh, again, reactivation of old structures, um, but, but very, very distant from the plate boundaries over in California, but causing earthquakes that have a lot of similarities to um, other places in the middle of continents, or as I say, um, surprisingly only 150 kilometres or so from the plate boundary zone in New Zealand also in terms of the earthquake characteristics. Similar, looking at the um, hazard maps for both countries, this I think, I'm pretty sure they are the 10% um, and 50 year ground motions for both countries. I think the colour scheme is roughly approximate as well, so up here in the very darkest of uh, the red, so the cooler colours through to the hotter colours here following the plate boundary. Uh, the Alpine Fault and some of the other faults are the highest risk or highest hazard areas in New Zealand. Uh, similarly in the, UA, uh, in the western um, um, area and also in the New Madrid um, region driven by these 500, driven by the uh, 500 year re return periods on the, uh, on the New Madrid zone. So this includes the prior earthquakes in central US. Here, this is prior to the Christchurch earthquakes. So the value here is at about 0.3G PGA for a, a 
essentially works out to be the design level for Christchurch. That was what was in the code. Um, this here includes, I think, some conditional probability of the enhancement or how far um, here we might have progressed through an earthquake cycle or some ideas like that. This does not include some of that, uh, that thinking, but this plot here shows what's happened in Christchurch after the Christchurch earthquakes with the recognition that we're in a sequence of earthquakes with probably a long, a long decay curve of the seismicity. So we could, in, right now, the hazard is considerably higher than this 0.3G um, and it, it, it could have been at least 10 times that um, for the design level in the short term period. So that brought about a need to, for the rebuild phase, the building code requirement was changed within three months of the February earthquake to accommodate largely the expectation or the likelihood of um, earthquakes continuing to occur while we're in this decay phase, which based on some geophysics was thought to, it may extend um, approximately 20 years or more before we'd get back to some old, uh, some new, the new normal background um, state. So, so we were encouraged to do some rather rapid reassessment so that the rebuild period, so there was confidence in the rebuild that the um, an enhanced code level would cope with expected or the possibility of these um, these large earthquakes that could still occur during the rebuild period. In terms of ongoing seismicity, of course, that it is still ongoing here in the Mississippi embayment, and this is something um, I've just picked up from my US colleagues. Um, Certainly significant events occurring. Uh, the, the question is whether they're aftershocks still, very late aftershocks of a 200-year-old sequence, or whether they are the background loading rate um, of the, the future earthquakes, I think are really interesting scientific questions. But of course they do play strongly into uh, considerations of, of code and uh, what should be done here in Memphis in terms of earthquake um, strengthening. In Christchurch, this was our pattern of uh, earthquakes. They came in, 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 in swarm-like almost uh, through the period from the initial event, the magnitude 7.1 in September of 2010. Um, you see these gaps of six, of six months or so. This is the February event. This is June 13th. This is the activity at the end of 2012. So in similar, similar to uh, the gaps between the major events here in the 1811-1812 sequence, we're really pleased to say that this was the last magnitude 5 we had, which was middle of 2012. So we've managed 18 months now without a magnitude 5, which is, which is a really good feeling. And ever since the beginning of 2013, I think there's a, there's a different feeling that uh, maybe we're in, really are in the waning phase. Although we're still, based on these um, um, earthquake forecast statistical models, there is still a significant chance of a magnitude six. And that may still exist for many decades to go. So we do need to build that into the thinking in terms of the rebuild period. Just to say just how unusual, and this plays into the levels of damage that occurred, when we look at the ground motions from the February 22nd event, and this is for um, four events, four stations in the middle of Christchurch, this is the 10% and 50 year spectrum, which was the basis for the residential uh, construction. This is the 2% in 50 year spectrum, which is what, say, the Christchurch Hospital would have been designed to. This is the actual records showing a lot of energy out here, up to about one second. A very strange, probably, basin response 
um, phase out there at about three seconds uh, spectral period that are significantly above the 2,500 year or the 2% in 50 year ground motion. So when we're looking at damage and we're looking at the impacts, we really need to take this into account that the February 22nd event in particular was a very rare event and very large, so we need to assess our um, expectations of performance against that, um, against this sort of data. So there's a few um, things, summaries out of this. I'd certainly want to like to make this um, PowerPoint available to you so you can go through that a little bit more slowly. But this is a very big event for New Zealand. Well, it's a moderate sized event in a very small economy. Now, New Zealand's economy is tiny. Um, with some of the, the numbers there. Um, it impacted a very large percentage, 10% maybe of, the, of New Zealand's total population of four and a half million people were directly impacted. Um, total loss estimates have gone up to around about 50 billion New Zealand dollars at the moment, around 20% of GDP. Um, that's about, in terms of impact on GDP, that's about four times the Hurricane Katrina impact on the US economy and twice even the impact of Tohoku with tsunami, with um, um, radio, radioactive, the um, problems. So, yeah, moderate to large event in a small economy. So that's that's also very has been very impacting on a lot of the policy decisions and a lot of the thinking in New Zealand. Um, these have been seen in other jurisdictions, other. Big events and small economies can be really economy changing for, for a very long time. However, in Christchurch, surprisingly, the, the regional economy has been really strong and based on an agricultural hinterland, uh, the port and the airport and the road and the rail service were all um, restored relatively quickly. And even though I think the port has about $400 million worth of damage, it's doubled its output, its throughput, in the period since the February 22nd earthquake. So there's been a lot of resiliency, perhaps by chance rather than design, I would say, but to observe that, it's been really important. Um, there has been quite a lot of impact into, into the city in terms of tourism, um, overseas students and education, and obviously hospitality. Uh, so there's been big impacts on that part of the economy, and there was some migration away from the city to start with, but now we're back to the stage of having uh, above, I think, February 2011 levels of um, population in Christchurch. So there hasn't been a big migration away. Um, something like 95% of businesses are still operating, albeit dislocated into some other areas. Uh, and that, So the regional economy has been going along quite strongly. One of the key factors there in the, there was that there was early government support for local business continuity and also to support the workers when those small companies, small and medium enterprises, were shut down because of the earthquake. There was support from government for those workers so they didn't move away from the city. Um, that, I think, it cost about $210 million, I think. It was probably the best $210 million that the government could possibly have ever spent. It kept the workforce in town it kept businesses um, viable, and so there was a restart quite quickly. So we've learned from that, I guess, that the supply chains and the shelter in place where at all possible is the thing to keep a community, keep a city uh, going. If there had been big translocation of the population or business moving to other centres, then it's really hard to get, get it back again. So I think we're thinking about that very strongly with respect to uh, future natural hazard events in other New Zealand cities. Uh, in terms, just some very briefly, I haven't got very many pictures of buildings or anything, but just in summary, in terms of residential, um, through the whole, the, generally the performance has been really good. Uh, many of the New Zealand building stock is often light wood or steel frame construction. Uh, and there were very few collapses and no loss of life and general repairability within the, build, within the residential building stock. This is due to shaking. 
Um, this is even at those very extreme ground motions. There were failures on flat ground due to ground performance, in other words, liquefaction, and on the hills due to rockfall and, uh, and, and shaking as well because of amplified ground motions on ridge crests. The exceptions in terms of residential performance were the older, unreinforced um, or lightly reinforced masonry buildings. They suffered pretty badly. Again, um, September the 4th, at about the design level, and in February 22nd, way above the design level. So we've got to bear that into account, bear that in our thinking when we think about the performance even of these um, rather poorer uh, building stock. Talking briefly, but well, there's, there's, so there's, there's about 190,000 residential buildings in Christchurch. Those, the darker colours, the black there is where there's 100% loss. There's, they're beyond repairable. And when you track where the, the dark red and the black ones are, they follow the old river course or the current river course of the Avon River down through here into the estuary. And some out here on, the, on this very recent um, spit here. This is into some of the hillsides. Oops. Hillside suburbs to the south of the city. Sorry, David, your computer <laughs> took a crash. Uh, yeah, so we're seeing that that's, all of that is largely due to ground deformation, in other words, liquefaction. Um, here on the hills due to, to rockfall. So this was the basis. Uh, so we've understood the ground motions. We've understand a lot now the ground conditions very well. And that led to some of the thinking about whether this was a reoccupation zone, whether it should rebuild in some of these areas or not. So there's some quite strong government thinking or direction about where and how to, how to rebuild the city. If we look at the non-residential, and this is really hard to get across that Actually, the building performance in residential space in Christchurch was, on the whole, very good. We've seen, you know, code level twice, three times uh, occurrences, and something at about the, you know, the critical facility type um, ground shaking level in February the 22nd. So, most modern buildings performed as they were ex um, expected, with a couple of exceptions, and if you'd been following the cases there, there was two commercial buildings which did collapse. They were not the ones that we would expect to have collapsed, so there's some very particular issues with those two buildings. But other buildings of the same generation, same design in general, actually performed quite well. And most modern buildings post-1995, say, when we did a revision to the code, performed very well. Things like the irregularity of the building and, and older structures, irregular shaped buildings didn't perform very well, nor did the, some of the older structures. And of course, unstrengthened and unsecured masonry buildings were essentially destroyed, although a lot of that, the masonry buildings, URM in New Zealand, frequently has a wooden frame or a wooden um, frame over which the bricks uh, put. So many of the unreinforced masonry buildings, that the masonry fell into the street and many of the deaths were actually on the street rather than in the building. But that's perhaps different from the URM here where there isn't that wooden um, frame over which the bricks are put. So we've got to think about that when we're comparing URM damage between the two cities. Uh, but interestingly there was a few reinforced or strengthened masonry buildings and they performed either moderately well to very well, even at these extreme ground motions. So they weren't fully um, strengthened to up to a modern or 100% of new building standard as we talk about. They were rather selectively and I think carefully um, retrofitted to look at what the Achilles heel of each of these buildings were, and actually they performed very well. So a couple of, um, just a couple of, perspectives and, and sorry I'm getting ahead of myself there so just a summary of some of those things there emphasizing that masonry buildings can be economically retrofitted I think 
that often in New Zealand they need to secure the parapets and secure them from the end wall from falling into the street. Uh, not so much of an issue. Often they did have light um, steel roof, or um, so the roofing wasn't particularly an issue. But chimneys and parapets are just so obvious. So if we look at a couple of comparisons, I've covered most of this. September 2010 was a near design level event and the damage wasn't too bad. Services re restored pretty quickly. Um, so that's a sort of a, New Zealand thought it was pretty clever in September the 4th. But February the, the, of 2011 was sort of a near to a 2500 year return period event. Again, the damage was largely as we would have expected. Most engineers, engineered structures performed quite well. Infrastructure, though, was very badly damaged, especially in what were these future red zones, which I'll come to, and in Eastern Christchurch, largely driven by this liquefaction induced damage. Um, there is, there has been in this bullet point here, I think, is something that we're now, is something that I think David could probably will come to in his presentation that although from a technical or a engineering or a, or a scientific point of view, we would say the city and the people did quite well, the expectations now from the people would, from the public generally, is that future events, the city needs to be designed so that there's essentially little or no damage, even in extreme events. This now represents a real uh, political, social dilemma in terms of knowing that the building code needs to be based on probabilistic methods, etc. How can we convey that there is risk all around us and that actually driving on the roads is probably more dangerous than being in some of these even sort of low building standard um, housing? But the public perception in this is that they want to be absolutely secure against the earthquakes, although this is largely, of course, a Christchurch perspective where the earthquakes already happened and people aren't quite in the same mindset where the earthquakes haven't yet happened. So <laughs> there's quite a lot of work to do in this space. So we, we come to these, uh, I think, still ex very important questions for which there is no um, answer, I think, yes, because the, we haven't really had this discussion. Was the performance good enough in an extreme event? What does good enough mean? What's sustainable? What are acceptable uh, levels of safety and economic resilience. Now we've retreated from some of the residential areas, so maybe that presumes that that was an unacceptable. Um, the other big question is this question of repairability and functionality in extreme events. Now the building codes are all about life safety, they're not about functionality, and what do we expect as a society of a city in terms of its continued uh, viability against the competition of all of the cities that surround it so that um, a city remains viable even during and after um, significant natural hazard events. The liquefaction is pretty easily understood in Christchurch and in fact it's been known since the 1980s where the susceptible ground was. Um, so no real surprises, it's, it's built out over a top of a older estuary, so there's a little skiff of gravel across the top of a uh, estuarine sands and silts. Um, it's very well documented, it's been known about the 1980s. This comes out of a historical atlas of 1997, but in fact much of the work was done in the 1980s and, and, and older, and in fact the liquefaction that did occur mapped quite well to the areas that were mapped as susceptible to liquefaction. So, no, no big surprise there. Uh, the liquefaction was terrible. Um, there's one of our colleagues at Canterbury had eight different liquefaction events at his house. It is in the red zone, so he is not rebuilding there. But yeah, eight times, well, as many as eight times people were out cleaning up this sort of mess over this extended period of time. And I would suggest that, I don't know whether that was well documented here in 1811-12, but I would expect that the, in a sequence, a repeat of that must have been something similar to this. Uh, the other big issue, of course, we're seeing that, you know, with hindsight, how were people ever allowed to live in some of these locations. 
Uh, it's, it's, it, everybody would think this is inconceivable that you were allowed to build a house at the bottom of some of these cliffs. Uh, here, these, these, these were just horrific ideas. For, this is February the 22nd, fortunately, when many of the people were not at home, they were out at work. These boulders that came down the hill at enormous speeds um, through houses. Um, if it's been estimated if, if this event had occurred at night time when all of the people were at home, then the death toll in Christchurch could well have been double what it was, and that was just from these um, boulders coming down the hill. Some people would facetiously say, we're OK at this place because the boulders in February went over the house. They didn't go through the house. They bounced right over the top. Well, <laughs> I thought that was fairly, uh, that was fairly um, optimistic. This is a snapshot of the central business district. Often thought of as that the damage was just terrible to these buildings, but we need to understand that the, the insurance policies on many of these buildings were for replacement, so that if you had a building that was really replaced, well, shall I fix this one up and it's still not up to new building standard, or shall I just say, please, insurance company, I'd like a new one, please. So a lot of the demolition has been due to the way the insurance has been written, and that really needs to be understood when looking at some of these photographs. But Christchurch is a bit of a blank canvas. Uh, this is up until November of 2012. Some key buildings are still there, but there's an awful lot that is not from prior to the event. It has meant, though, that the, the rebuild of Christchurch can be um, essentially a 21st century built from a blank canvas which is, with hind well, as we've moved on two years or so now, we can think of that as a tremendous opportunity. So what did we get right, or what did we get wrong in Christchurch? And I think it comes back to the liquefaction question. It, uh, particularly in around about land use planning, that we've been thinking so much in terms of hazard, but not the risk. So we've been... A lot of the policy has been written around the hazard, the likelihood of the event, but not what the consequences were. So we weren't really dealing with risk at all. So that's been, I think, the biggest lesson we need to communicate and think in terms of risk. So Christchurch is in a moderate to low seismicity zone, but there were large parts of the city that were prone to severe liquefaction, which was really well known. But Eastern Christchurch was developed with only the hazard considerations in mind not the consequences of this rare event occurring. And the damages and losses associated with liquefaction are up to the order of 50% of that $50 billion. New Zealand is very heavily insured. Um, you can see on the right there that the sort of 80% um, insurance contribution to the rebuild in Christchurch, very, very high levels, probably the highest in the world. Insurance as a mechanism of risk transfer is extremely important to us. It's really important we maintain that too, which is all about maintaining confidence in the insurance industry that New Zealand is a, is a good place to invest. So that rep represents some significant challenges uh, in terms of communication from science and engineering into the insurance industry. So the looking forward, as I said previously, the code was raised the building code was raised by, by about 35% to cope with um, expected um, aftershocks or the likelihood of, of, of further large events. Uh, we've put a lot of that forecasting of future events into a time varying hazard model and that is being communicated in and increasingly understood by the public. There's been quite a lot of land zoning and there will be improved foundations to rebuild in some of the softer soil areas and so we're looking forward to rebuild and repair. So this reducing future risk, which is good from the insurance side, and this residential red zone, um, sorry, that's how many, um, there's about 190,000 houses in Christchurch, about 8,000 of those have been retreated from, these are these red areas that are thought these are not viable to rebuild on, They've sunk, they're in the flood zone, they're extremely susceptible to further liquefaction from further earthquakes, either nearby or even further away. 
the 600 properties on the Port Hills that have been uh, abandoned and will not be rebuilt. It's about a total of 4% of the residential uh, zones have been so-called red zoned. On the flatland, it's due to future economic loss, and on the Port Hills, due to future life risk issues. So that, in some sense, is a, is a retrospective land use planning exercise. So we think about this, we should not have been, with hindsight, should not have built in those places in the first place. The building stock going forward in Christchurch will be very different. We have a bunch of um, these old unreinforced masonry. Um, going forward, there's more of these viscous damped um, structural uh, base isolated moment frames. So the building profile, that's another resilience measure going forward, that the new city, when it's rebuilt, will be much more resilient than what we have had. Major lessons, land use planning comes back as, as the key uh, reduction mechanism that we have not used very effectively in New Zealand, so that we have continued to build on land, which, okay, the hazard's low, but the consequences or the impacts are potentially very high. We've got to do, be doing better with that. Uh, Earthquake-prone building risk has not been very well done. There's been earthquake-prone building registers in most, of the in most of the cities of the country, but the mechanisms or the financial mechanism to do the retrofit has not been found, and there's been an extended period, always an extension of time to do the retrofit. There's been uh, some rather poor communication around what the building codes really mean and what inspections after an event really mean in terms of safety. Uh, engineers and scientists have used some of the wrong terminology. There's been words like safe uh, without a context, so this building is safe. Uh, safe to what? Uh, that's been quite poor. And, and, and earthquake scientists have talked in terms of earthquake magnitudes, not the impacts of those earthquakes. There's a lot of uh, pushback in the community in Christchurch. How come an aftershock is allowed to do more damage than the big earthquake? So we've got into a big discussion around what's an aftershock and what's not. We should have been talking about impact all of the time. Um, there's some technical things around energetic earthquakes, et cetera, et cetera, which uh, could change some of our thinking around the code requirements. But this last point, I think, is really important. Increasingly, with business interruption and, and economic futures, Codes generally are thought about in terms of life risk only, but what about functionality post-event? I think it's a really big challenge, I think, globally. So we're re rebuilding. We've still got a lot of work to do in Christchurch. There's still, because of this claim settlement of insurance, it's really complicated. Uh, there's building standards to be thinking about. There's insurability and confidence. There's confidence of investment back in Christchurch. Requires a lot of work for the from the technical side to get the messages across. So we're sort of on, on, a, on a path, but the path has been a bit shaky to start with, and I don't think we've yet really addressed some of the really fundamental issues that need to be there for the rebuild of Christchurch and how that plays out into other cities in New Zealand. So thank you very much for, for that. <laughs>